Major support for Carolina Business Review provided by Colonial Life, providing benefits to employees to help them protect their family, their finances, and their futures. High Point University, the premier life skills university, focused on preparing students for the world as it is going to be. And Sonoco, a global manufacturer of consumer and industrial packaging products and provider of packaging services with more than 300 operations in 35 countries. Well, Happy New Year. Thank you for watching and supporting this program after 30 plus years seen across the Carolinas for at least all of that time. I am Chris William. Thank you for supporting this dialogue. In a moment, we will unpack what may be surprising about the economy and everything related from jobs to lending to interest rates with our resident economists. And we start right now. Gratefully acknowledging support by Martin Marietta, a leading provider of natural resource-based building materials, providing the foundation upon which our communities improve and grow. Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Visit us at SouthCarolinaBlues.com. The Duke Endowment, a private foundation enriching communities in the Carolinas through higher education, health care, rural churches, and children's services. On this edition of Carolina Business Review, the economic forecast for 2023, featuring Dr. John Connerton of UNC Charlotte, Dr. Laura Ulrich of the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, Dr. Frank Hefner from the College of Charleston, and Sarah House of Wells Fargo Securities. Hello and welcome again to our program. Sarah, let's start with you. What do you think is going to be the biggest surprise? What will be the breakout that we don't see coming? Well, I think one big surprise that we could see is potentially just how tight the Fed keeps policy this year. So if you look at where markets were expecting policy to be after the Fed's final meeting of this past year, so they're still looking for rates not only to get as high as the Fed expected, but also some cuts in the back end. And I think even as we see the economy head for a downturn and likely to see the unemployment rate rise pretty markedly here, that the Fed's going to stay the course and make sure that inflation is well and truly back in the bottle. And, and I think it's a different reaction function that a lot of people just still don't believe. You think the Fed's staying higher for longer is higher. what you're saying? Higher for longer. It's been a message they've been trying to push. I don't think markets have, have quite listened, <laughs> but I think uh, they, they could be in for a wake-up call next yeah. year. So the Fed is actually the parent in the room when it comes to the economy to some degree, you think? Trying Let's to, hope so. Yeah, okay. You know <laughs> Someone has ask to be. You know I can't ask you that question. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? It's a big surprise. Big surprise. Well, you know, I think that it'll be interesting to see in February meeting when the, the FOMC board changes a little bit uh, whether or not Sarah's right. Um, certainly, you know, Jerome Powell has been you very hawkish. You think monetary policy then in general? Is yeah, I think monetary policy in general is going to be the issue. I, I suspect that the Fed will get a little bit queasy um, and probably not go to five and a half percent, which is what a lot of predictors are suggesting right now is where they're going to go and, and where they're going to cap. I, I wouldn't be surprised to see 25 basis points in uh, in February. Mm -hmm. Okay, Frank. Well, a uh, number of things. I think if the uh, international scenes stabilize, a big surprise if the Ukraine issue was completely done, and if uh, Russia reorganized, uh, which probably is on the horizon, I think that's going to be a big takeaway for next year. Um, the inflation issue, of course, is going to be the big one and, and how the Fed responds to mm -hmm. that. Um, possibly, I would say, the disconnect between inflation and unemployment. So that would be very surprising. So the idea is that, is it necessarily true that in order to break inflation, we're going to create unemployment? Yeah. And, and that, that, to me, would, that would be a, a breakout a okay. point. Biggest surprise for you, Laura. I, I agree with Frank on that, and I think, you know, it's kind of long been debated in my, you know, how much does the Phillips curve matter? Does it exist? Right. Is it, should <laughs> we just throw it out? Um, I, I, I can tell you what I, I hope the biggest surprise is, is that we keep seeing positive CPI reports like we saw this past week. And right now, you know, people will ask me, how high do you think rates will have to go? Or, you know, when do you think we'll go into a recession? Will we go into recession? And depending on what data has just been released, there's times when mm -hmm. I feel more positive or less positive. But right now we're in a we're in a situation where at least right now prices are coming down. Consumer spending's remaining mm -hmm. pretty resilient. Employment's remaining strong. So I hope that the biggest surprise is that we get a softer landing than many people predicted well, in the first place. Laura, John just 
chalked about five and a half percent. A lot of people call that the terminal rate. And, and this is an academic question, but why is the terminal rate important? It's talked about so much, but why the terminal rate? What does that mean? I mean, I think a lot of these rates, like we, we have had, it has been such a long period of time since we've had increases mm -hmm. in interest rates, right? Really meaningful increases in interest rates. And so I think a lot of these macroeconomic terms, whatever they are, whether you're talking about terminal rate, Phillips curve, um, I'm not really sure we know exactly what it means anymore. I mean, we're in a really different economy. We're in more of a global economy. We're in, in the midst of, of different demographics than we had mm -hmm. um, 40 plus years ago when, when we had inflation and rates like this. So I think in my, I'm a microeconomist, but in macroeconomic circles, there's a lot of debate about all sorts of, uh, all sorts of policies and, and, and the existence of certain things that we mm -hmm. learned about in textbooks that may, may no longer mm -hmm. be relevant. So I'm not sure I, I think of it as being as, as important as maybe some other people. And I don't think the Fed itself worries about the terminal no, rate. No, I don't think so either. <clears throat> they worry about the neutral rate. Here yes. we go, more jargon. Yeah, right. <laughs> <That's great. clears throat> and basically, they, that's the rate at which, <clears throat> excuse me, that's the rate at which above that rate, monetary policy is contractionary, below it, it's expansionary. Mm -hmm. um, there, we don't know what the neutral rate is. They don't know what it is, but they do have an estimate, and they're looking at about four and a half percent. So when they hit four and a half percent, which they're getting close to hitting, um, then the, at that point in time, monetary policy, to, okay. in their eyes, becomes contractionary. And that's, so that's about a soft landing. That's what they're yeah, trying to moderate. Right. right. But so, I think before yeah. this, a lot of people thought the the neutral rate was below four and a half percent. Yeah. That you would start seeing bigger pullbacks. So that's what, you know. But well, the whole concept of a soft landing presupposes that you have to create a recession right. in order to break the back of inflation. And, and, and I'm not 100% sure that that's always the case. You do have to restrict money growth in order to reduce inflation. You don't necessarily have to create a recession. Yeah. The real bugaboo in all of this has been something you said you all talked about on the last time we were together mm -hmm. on the previous program and the idea of the job how did you call it the job full recession. job full recovery so recession. Sarah, I'm sorry job <laughs> full yeah, recession Sarah how, how is labor gonna un, unfold this year so we think that it's going to be a, a harder year for for the jobs market. So even at the end of, of this, higher this past year, higher unemployment, we think we'll actually see some net job losses in the second half of the year, and that's coming from the fact that given the higher financing environment, the slowdown in growth, the uncertainty, mm -hmm. the squeeze on profit margins, that's going to have an impact on both business investment as well as the number of workers that businesses are able to hire. There's a lot. There's still a lot of job demand out there, so we don't think this is right around the corner, but we have seen measures of labor demand begin to begin to roll over. So everything from the number of small businesses saying they have at least one job hard to fill, just the sheer number of job openings in, in the economy, you're seeing even just turnover slow down in terms of people just job switching less. So we are seeing the labor market cooling uh, mm -hmm. um, layoffs ticking up a little bit, so still at historically low levels, but I think we have seen the tide begin to turn a little bit, and I think just given the cost of labor, so that's one thing we haven't really talked about is that's, I think, going to be a key source of inflation pressure next year. Is yes, we're seeing improvement in supply chains. Yes, we're seeing energy prices come down. That's all great for the inflation picture, but it's going to be hard to get inflation back down to 2% on a sustained basis mm -hmm. if you still have labor costs running 5 to 6%, like mm -hmm. the most recent data has pointed, and so that's going to yeah. be key is, is seeing that labor market cool if we really are going to get inflation back towards the Fed's target. And things moving forward are going to look different because of because of demographic shifts. We're going to be in a tighter labor market. I mean, we're going to have lower labor supply um, for it's quite a low while, now, right? Yeah, but it's going to get it's even worse. worse. I mean, especially mm -hmm. if you look at. I mean, my, I would think so anyway. And especially if you look at even the number of hours younger people want to work compared to what their parents worked, you might have the same number of people working mm -hmm. in some cases, but it not equaling out to the same amount of work, right? And so, I think based on a lot of trends we're seeing, we're going to be in a low labor supply mm -hmm. environment for quite a while, unless we have some major change in immigration policy mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that. And so, to Sarah's point, that would lead you to believe that wage growth will likely be higher um, than we saw before mm -hmm. before this. And so um, I, I think I, I agree with what Sarah said. It's hard to be at 2% if wage, wage growth um, is mm -hmm. as high as it might end up being. But mm -hmm. in the Carolinas, we will get migration. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Yep. It doesn't have yeah. to be foreign. We're getting in migration mm -hmm. from across the country. 
and, and that's what's really helping us out on our labor force. And, and given everything that's going on, at least in South Carolina, we need that in migration because we yes. just don't have the workers. Mm -hmm. But, mm -hmm. you know, the big thing that the Fed's going to face this year mm -hmm. is the so-called wage price spiral. Right. And we've already seen indications at the end of 22 about this. We saw Delta Airline pilots agree to an enormous raise. It's over five years, but it's still pretty, pretty significant. Uh, we're not sure what's going to happen with the railroad workers, but they're looking at a pretty significant raise. It's, again, it's over five years, but still, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's quite significant. And the big issue is in the service industry, where uh, those wages are going to continue to have pressure there because they're still not back up to historic levels in terms of employment in the service industry. So that's going to be a real problem the Fed's going to have to face. We still have 10 million unfilled jobs, okay, that's not changing. Um, as Sarah mentioned, we've got, you know, this, uh, the layoffs haven't really been coming that heavily. We don't see new filings for unemployment insurance that are up mm -hmm. to, they're still mm -hmm. at pretty low levels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you may be, I hate to admit this, Frank, but you may be right <laughs> about the job on. full recession. We may see GDP start to slow. We may have another quarter or two of GDP decline this year. It's still but, iffy, but, I, I'm concerned but I'm not sure the employment rate's going to rise very much. The channels here being a macroeconomist. I mean, <clears throat> there is no interest rate policy that'll get you more airline pilots. Right. It just won't happen. Oh, yeah. And the other thing is, in a lot of, the, and this is something you might want to address because of the labor markets, things that you want to analyze, mm -hmm. is, is it that we have a labor shortage or is it a disconnect between the jobs that are going to be open and the people that are available? Because yeah. you can raise wages and you're not going to get oh. more pilots for a while. Okay, before Frank takes over as moderator and tosses it to you. Thank you, though, Frank. Yeah, certainly. I, I want to, let's look past the work. One job could just, be. Just, All right, stop it, you two. Uh, let's go pa past the workers' comp issue right. of, of workers and labor, and let's talk about productivity. Mm -hmm. What does that look like, and how does, and, yeah, I know. How does that affect all of this? Yeah, it's going to have a big effect on it. And is it going up? Well, it's been going down. And, and I think workers are sending signals mm -hmm. about how the world has changed. And some companies are adapting and some are not. And the ones that are not adapting are going to struggle because we're in a different paradigm now. Do the workers hold now. all the cards? Well, because of the, they don't hold all the cards. But if you look at labor force participation rate and labor supply, they're going to hold more cards than they did before. I don't think we're going to be in a scenario where companies think, well, I don't like the way Laura's working. I'm going to get rid of her, and tomorrow I'm going to hire Sarah, and she's going to come in and be just as productive and, and just as good. Um, companies, I think, are going to be slower to lay off because they're afraid that they can't hire somebody. Um, and, and I think workers are going to ha hold more cards. If you look at kind of the landscape of labor and what, you know, think about manufacturers, what they used to provide their people, right? I mean, mm -hmm. there was mill housing. There was a company store. If you yeah, sure. worked really hard, you got a little coupon, you go get yourself a ham mm -hmm. at the company store or whatever. They provided a more holistic set of benefits. That ended because women rushed into the labor force and the baby boomers ended entered workforce age, and so they didn't have to do that anymore. You know, there was an excess supply of labor. Mm -hmm. We're just not going to be in that world anymore, and so I think that's why you hear companies talking about providing child care on site or mm -hmm. providing housing mm -hmm. subsidies, or, I mean, we even have heard, some, you know, the, uh, the Cherokee um, Casino, they, mm -hmm. they purchased a manufactured home company to be able to provide their people housing. So I think that's why we're hearing some of those conversations because companies, some companies are adapting and are aware that this isn't just about COVID. There's other things going on too. And so going forward, it looks different. Okay, and I know you want to wait in on this and I know you have a good <laughs> opinion on this, but Sarah, I also, I want to ask you as, w the, the cycle of this new working model mm -hmm. seems to be longer than a couple of years, or maybe even three years, that this is going to be a very long learning cycle for both employers and employees. So um, as, it as, it, as it moderates and the employees start losing some leverage and companies have lost leverage, I mean, how does all this play out? As, as Laura just talked about it, how do you see that model? So, so I think we need to separate the cyclical sides from the longer term mm -hmm. secular okay. trends. Mm -hmm. So I think kind of where we are in the cycle, we're starting to see workers' position get a little bit weaker mm -hmm. as I think businesses are getting a little bit more conservative. They're looking ahead at potential downturn. And so they're, they're just thinking twice about, you know, do I need that additional 
professional worker. And so, but then I think we also have to couple that with those longer term demographic aspects that we're seeing in terms of just the sheer slowdown in the working age population. You couple that with you know, lower participation mm -hmm. rates uh, across some key ho cohorts within that, that group. And then you are looking at, I think, on, you know, for any point in the cycle, a potentially tighter labor market, just given those demographic trends. And so that's going to have impact on wages. It's going to have impact on inflation. And therefore, it could potentially have an impact on kind of what that longer term mm -hmm. rate of, of interest rates are. Do we know what productivity is going to be for remote workers? <laughs> is it better? It's, is it, it's unclear. It's true. Yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. But, you know, back to that original productivity question, first two quarters of 2022, productivity declined by more than any okay. period mm -hmm. in history mm -hmm. going back to 1947. So we had really serious productivity declines in the first two quarters of this year. And that's a big thing. But, you know, back to this, this issue about the, the demographics and the changing demographics. Here's what I'm really looking into in 2023 that I'm kind of curious. Is got to keep my fingers crossed. <laughs> We're going to have divided government. <clears throat> Republicans are going to control the House. Democrats are going to control the Senate and, and the presidency. And... One of the ways that you can get yourself out of this problem, we're going to have a problem that none of us have ever experienced before, and that's a labor, labor shortage. It's clear about that. Retirees are going to outnumber new entrants. So, so you immigration, think it's going to get even worse than it is now? And, and, measurably and less, in, 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 unless Congress becomes okay. adults and decides <laughs> they're going to have a comprehensive immigration reform okay. that's not just going to be an open border and you know whoever can scramble in, scramble in, but we can start to selectively pick and choose occupations uh, to help su su supplement. And, you know, as Sarah was mentioning before about there's a mismatch between what companies need and what labor is out there. That could be part of the reason we have 10 million openings, okay, unfilled openings. So this is a big issue, and, and we've been, you know, we, we have been experiencing talk about inf uh, immigration reform for t over 20 years. I mean, it goes all the way back to the Reagan administration. You think fiscal policy is going to have to catch up with real world? Uh, you think congressional action is going to happen? Not, you know, this, is, this is just congressional action yeah. on a particular issue okay. that could eliminate some of the problems we're having right now. Frank? Sounds fine to me. I mean, I mentioned we need workers. And if you're talking about South Carolina, we can get them from Ohio. That's great. But where's Ohio get yeah. their workers? And in and, and a lot of the uh, lower skilled jobs, we have in migration from overseas uh, quite a bit in the area. So um, that, that's going to be the key for providing this. As far as the labor issues and productivity, um, the businesses, especially in retail, I've noticed, are reluctant to hire that extra person. And the customers are noticing that because you go into some of those retail stores, there's just no one there to help you sometimes. And then there are also the managers are putting more pressure on the people that are working to perform more. And that, the only way you're going to get that mm -hmm. is by either offering more amenities or a mm -hmm. higher salary. Uh, something related, uh, but off of workers, but certainly workers need housing. Uh, we've seen what housing prices do when mm -hmm. you own. Um, what's housing going to look like in 2003? I mean, I think we're going to continue to see, as rates go up, it's going to become an increasingly difficult environment, right, um, in housing. And um, already in places like Raleigh and Charleston and Charlotte, we weren't building enough houses to keep up mm -hmm. with the immigration. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we're going to see fewer houses built probably than we would have seen other, you know, otherwise. Because of the cost of money? Because of the, yeah, because the cost and people just, I mean, you know, you sit down to do that calculation of what house you can buy if your mortgage rate is seven or eight percent, it looks a lot different than if it's mm -hmm. 3.5, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think that it's just harder for, for families to buy homes at that, that, those rates. Um, I think we continue to hear that multifamily is a strong market in, in most of the Carolinas, um, but we also have an issue in the South of, of um, you know, NIMBYism and communities yes, not sir. wanting the density that we really need to be able to accommodate the workers that we need. So th to me, this is gonna be an ongoing problem um, into 2023 and one that communities are gonna continue to struggle with. D does affordable housing become more a, a bigger issue in 2023 now? because of some of the things that Laura said, but also because of the momentum? I, 
I, I think it'll stay an issue. I'm not sure if it'll be more. I mean, it's been a huge issue even in the past, even in the past few years, just given the run-ups we've seen in rents as well as home prices. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not sure it'll be more, yeah. but um, it's it's an ongoing issue. And I think one thing we've seen is that, you know, if, if we're talking about inflation being a problem and overall prices, well, you know, we saw this huge run-up in home prices, but really we haven't seen much give back in terms of prices just because um, where so many people have low mortgage rates, they're not putting their homes on the market. Mm -hmm. So households are getting locked in place and with that low inventory, you're not seeing much downward pressure on prices. So we've seen this hit to affordability, but builders can't make it up. And so we're, keep, we're keeping supply constrained. And so I think that's gonna keep this affordability issue very much in play. This, yeah. this Affordable housing year. has been a problem since the Great Recession <laughs> slash financial recession. Mm -hmm. uh, regulations and, and that were put in, policies that were put in, has made it very, very difficult to easily construct new houses mm -hmm. on spec. So um, yeah, it's, it's, it goes back a ways and it's not gonna get any better going forward. Is there an economic solution for affordable housing? And I mean affordable housing and being able to afford a home, but also affordable housing for those that are at greater risk and can't even buy a home and want to buy a home. Well, that's a good question. I mean, yeah, there's an economic solution. Mm -hmm. Triple my salary. And <laughs> so I can afford the yeah. 7%. I mean, my first mortgage when I first bought a house was 7%. So, um, but the house was But the not asset as, price was a lot, 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 too, lot right? lower also. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing. And housing prices tend to be very sticky. They, they tend to go up faster than they ever go down. Mm -hmm. So you run into that issue. But uh, we're running into it across the board. Uh, uh, educators, uh, the public school system can't afford to live anywhere near their schools in many mm -hmm. communities in North and South Carolina. Uh, school boards are having to raise salaries to attract teachers. Uh, and so this is gonna have longer term public finance ripple effects. Because once you increase their salary, you don't really get to ever take it back. Yeah, so that, 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 yeah. that ends up being that problem. But, it's gonna create other issues for us though besides uh, labor, uh, existing labor, but given so many projects in South Carolina are on economic the, development, economic project. development projects are on the books. There, I mean, we've got the the huge battery recycling plant coming into Berkeley County. They're looking at possibly hiring 1,500 workers. Well, they're not going to get 1,500 workers from the Charleston metropolitan area necessarily. So that's going to be more in migration. That's going to put more demand on housing. Go, go ahead, Jeff. Historically, <clears throat> affordable housing has come from what urban economists call filtering process, right. which is where houses filter down and become lower rent or, or lower priced. And we've seen a, an end to that mm -hmm. a, in this century, essentially, so that these older neighborhoods where the housing would come a little bit in disrepair and the rents would drop or the prices would drop, they're now being snatched up mm -hmm. and being gentrified. I mean, we see it here in Charlotte for mm -hmm. sure, uh, where they go into neighborhoods and they just basically you know, buy the property, tear the house down, and start all over again. And corporate corporate landlords have been blamed for that as the dark overlords. Is that true? I, I don't know that they're the problem per se. They they could be part of the problem, but you know, I mean, and there has been a tremendous change. But again, it's just simply the number of units. And if you're not building, at, you know. It, it, New construction is a lot more expensive than used houses. If you're not building new construction, you don't have that filtering process taking place. People are saying, well, I I'm not gonna buy a new house, I'll buy something and fix it up. Mm -hmm. And you go through neighborhoods in Charlotte, you go through neighborhoods in Columbia, you go through neighborhoods in Charleston, and this is happening all over. Yeah, Laura, that's the dark side of economic development. Does that ever change, or is this how in migration and, and the move to the new south, is, is, this, is this what we have now? I think there are policies that could change it. I think there are things, uh, you know, I think we've had movement towards a lot of um, local policy that's made it very difficult mm -hmm. a across the country, but in multiple places in the Carolinas, we've had restrictive, I mean, we've had moratoriums placed on multifamily yeah, that makes it worse. Right. We've had, um, you know, like I mentioned the NIMBYism, but you know, requirements where you have to have an acre per lot in some places, like just things that make it even more difficult. And, and so I think there could be um, potentially some policy changes over time. Um, there's also, I know there's some people in Charlotte that are work on, working on, you're, you're actually allowed to put what they call an accessible dwelling unit, an ADU in a backyard, it's like a tiny house. Um, but there's no way to finance that. 
So if I own a house in a neighborhood, maybe it's a neighborhood that is being gentrified, prices have really gone up, and if I sell my house, I've got, you know, I'm kind of so in a change difficult covenants spot. covenants to allow lenders to underwrite I those could loans. put an accessible dwelling in my backyard, but right now I have to come up with the cash okay. to do that because you can't. So there's a policy, you know, a financial policy that could happen there. So I think there's, you know, there's always an economic answer. Right. It may not be very politically tenable okay. at times. And it, it may not require answer. that you move to Detroit either. That's right. That's Where right. housing prices are a lot more reasonable. We have about a minute left. John, I'll start with you very quickly. Do you think there is a recession that will start in 2023? Uh, about one third yes, two thirds no. Okay. That's close enough. Laura, can you forecast that? I, I put it about 50 50 for me, but if there is a recession, I am hopeful that it would be m mild. Okay. So we, we think that there will be a recession at Wells Fargo. It, it's, it's our baseline, it's not a guarantee, but we'll say 60 40 recession. What about you? Moving. I know Wells Fargo says that. 60-40. Okay. <laughs> nice cover. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Depends on all those economists at the National Bureau of Economic Research and what they're looking at, whether we actually call it a recession. Mm -hmm. Things will slow down, that's clear, yeah. in a lot of different markets. Mm -hmm. But will they? Will it be dire? Will, it, will this cause major pain for most people? Probably not. Still, yes, there will be select people that will yeah. feel mm -hmm. that. But no, it, it, it'll be a pretty good year next year. Yeah, okay, well that's the end. And we'll play this back to you okay. in a year after that because I know Sarah loves that. Um, but thank you all for, you. for coming. And, and I genuinely mean this. Appreciate uh, you, your participation on this over the years. Uh, Frank, thanks for traveling in from Charleston. Mm -hmm. Sarah, always nice to see you. Dr. Ulrich, good to thank see you. you as well. And John, thanks for being. John was uh, one of the panelists on our very first program, so thanks wow. for sticking with us. Until next week, I'm Chris Williams. Happy holidays. Major funding for Carolina Business Review provided by High Point University, Martin Marietta, Colonial Life, The Duke Endowment, Sonoco, Blue Cross Blue Shield of South Carolina, and by viewers like you. Thank you. For more information, visit carolinabusinessreview.org.